Welcome to Tennis Spin, where we put our spin on your tennis. Got my buddy coach Rob here today, and uh, I thought about this video for a little while, and I was like, there's always movies of the decade, songs of the decade. Okay. What about rackets of the decades? Good one. Stay tuned. All right, so if you're of age, like our age, maybe a little older, maybe a little younger, you play tennis, you play tennis for maybe 40, 50 years, you kind of grew in generations and also with generations of rackets. And you've seen the evolution of rackets. So that's what we're actually going to be doing today is literally taking you in our history of a wooden racket to the most modern racket of today. And we're going to start in the 70s, though. Coach Rob, are you ready for this ride? I'm ready. I'm still trying to figure out your shirt sitch there. <laughs> Summer of Love. Did that? Uh, did you get that in the '60s, or did it fit you back then? I think this has seen better days in terms of fitting me. But I, it's the only thing I could find that kind of suited with this video, and I managed to squeeze myself into it. So, as you can probably see, I was probably smaller back <laughs> in, the, in in earlier days. Let's say. Where we all. <laughs> so I think I was. 50 pounds lighter when I had this shirt. Dang, 50. Anyways. Moving on. <laughs> let's talk about rackets that are maybe close to 50 years old first. So we'll start with the 70s. Um, in the 70s, Pro Staff. Yep. Jack Kramer. Jack Kramer. The Jack Kramer Pro Staff. Two different rackets. Um, both really good sticks. I, I know I grew up using the regular Jack Kramer. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think I was good enough for the pro staff when I was at that age, kind of learning and playing. Um, so that was a great stick. Now, what made this so good? Um, well, back then, good players used it. So I, I was young, so I can't say exactly <laughs> what they were shooting for, but I'm sure it was feel or weight or balance or... Maybe the wood was a little bit different or the way it was compressed or, I, you know. So it um, is laminated, I think, because it is shiny here. It is shiny, yeah. Um, it isn't like a square square. It isn't like a straight through. It's slightly round here, which I'm guessing makes it flexible. Because um, I know in graphite, it's flexible when it's rounded a bit. But it is square in, in here. Do you know what these diamonds mean? Nope. Okay. I was always wondering that when I was growing up. I'm sure somebody out there who knows the answer can put that on the uh, on the uh <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Comments. Let us know what the diamonds mean. And then this is a light four and one half original grip is my guess. Yep. And Looks like it. Nylon strings. Okay. So we start here. Um in I mean I always thought wooden racket was a wooden racket. Um but apparently, Jack was the star of the day. Therefore, everybody want to be like Jack. Just like everybody want to be like Mike in the 90s. <laughs> Talk about different game, though. All right. So, going into evolution, um, I feel like in the 70s, we were also dominated by another Wilson racket, the T2000. Let's go, Jimmy Connors. That's right. Now, Jimmy, Jimmy did very well with that racket, actually. Um, everybody who I talked to that played back then with a racket like this said, I don't know how I did it. I don't know how Jimmy did it. I mean, compared to, you know, later technology, this is a tough racket to play with. I mean, the sweet spot, the size of the ball. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like... And it was, like, heavy. Mm -hmm. Right, I can feel it right now. It's steel or 
aluminum, but I think it's steel. And, uh, but this kind of, I don't want to say ruled it, but it dominated a lot of the 70s uh, towards the latter end of it. Now, we also had Jimmy's arch nemesis, um, Johnny Mac, and he had the Max Ply. Right. The, the, max, wo the wood, wood Max the wood Ply Max. Ply. Ply. That's right. The so we had a wood max. versus a steel. Yep. Oh, too bad I don't have one of those. But um, yes, towards the latter part of the 70s, T2000, Max Ply. Dunlop versus Wilson. Very cool. Yes. So we're literally going from Wilson this, I mean, excuse me, wood to steel. And then we arrive, we arrive into the 80s. Now, would that be where we transition from the small head sizes into the first overhead size, the Prince? Yes. Prince Pro or Prince Classic, it kind of was the green-throated one, and then it went to the Prince Pro was the black. Definitely. Friend. We did a video on that, and those larger-headed Prince rackets, like the Prince Pro, um, did start in the 70s. So that was kind of a bridge into the 80s where you had larger rackets for people to play with that made it easy for them and right. the game. Yep. But you still had the little guys for the people who were better or pros. Or, or had grown up playing with them and were mm -hmm. used to hitting with that size and didn't need to... Um, you know, go to an oversized racket yet. Right. So the bridge from this into there was like those Prince oversizes, right? And then we went straight or eased into that one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the 85 Pro Staff. Midsize. Midsize. Back in the day. 85. Good luck finding a midsize today. Yeah, they don't exist. <laughs> <laughs> Except in the thrift store. <laughs> now... Full graphite now. You went from wood to steel to full graphite now. And this changed the lay of the land for rackets because now you got stiffer. You could hit a harder shot. Your balls now um, started to get faster, right? Um, you started... I, my first recollection of this racket was Chris Everett. Chris Everett was the one that with the steady shots and... In the racket, um, just hitting a flat ball right through the court, and I was like, "Man, I like I like Chris Everett." And she had her wood racket, her wood. Chris That's racket. right. Yep. That's right. I had it. It was yeah. my my Walgreens special, nine dollars and ninety nine cents in the seventies. <laughs> like this, this was expensive, right? This yep. was back in the day. I was like one seventy ish. That was a lot of money back then. Yeah. So the transition in the smaller heads are here. And then we went large. Prince Graphite 110. Right. Good stick. Now that changed a generation, I would say. If you're of the generation that started with these, suddenly Top Spin came into play. Boletary changed the way we gripped the racket. We went from a continental to a semi-west to an extreme west so that you have you brushed up on it a little bit more. But the bigger head allowed you to do that. Full graphite again, stabilizer bar is the signature of the graphite. So I feel like these two rackets kind of dominated the 80s. But I would like to add a caveat, though. You know, because McEnroe was so popular back then, you know, we had 200G, and you had Max Ply before that. And everybody wanted to be like Mac. Therefore, uh, we have to give honorable mention to the Max 200G. So there it is. And he won a smaller head. He's, he's uh, the servant volleyer, and... Uh, this was a tough racket to play with, too. Right. 
Yep. <laughs> I mean, he had to have great hands and great eyes. You know. And he had them. Yes, he did. Um, moving past the 80s into the 90s, we enter a different realm. We enter wide body, power, ease of play. Everybody was making a super thick racket. It started with profile and then evolved into hammer. And uh, do you remember? The, the first profile was kind of that goldish looking one. Mm -hmm. I think we did a video on one of those back in the day. Right. But yeah. Yeah. The, this was the goldish one. I don't know. It kind of faded into a, a little grayish for some reason. But I think when this was brand new, it was more um, silverish, silverish gold. Okay. Yeah, I think I think this faded. Eh, yeah. I don't think so. You don't but think so? maybe. Maybe my eyes are. It could be my eyes too. Now. But I thought it was silver. There was a gold. It was more gold, if I remember. Then it kind of had like um, the purplish writing where it said profile on the side. That's a four zero. This is okay. a two seven. Right. Okay. Yeah yeah. 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 So this was the the beast. Okay. The 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 most powerful of the Wilsons at. A 2.7 SI. Look at that. Goodwill special. Three ninety nine. Three dollars and ninety nine cents. <laughs> yep, got it at Goodwill, guys. Um, and somebody left the demo sticker on it still. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> but check this out. Um, wide body. They tapered it at the top. It was head heavy, so stabilized here, made it heavy here, so that when the ball impacts here. It's very stable here, but you get a little bit of a flex here, and that was about it. So you get a little racket speed with the thinner top and the head heaviness. Do you remember why they made hammer rackets? Uh, more power. Yes. The balance. Yes. Trying to give it, you know, the weight was all like a hammer. Mm -hmm. You know, you could, it was super light this way. and Right. And but it felt right much heavier going this way, so I think that was part of their you know trying to create that hammer sensation. Do you remember, according to Wilson, they made these rackets head heavy because all you had to do was bring the racket back and just throw the head at it, at it and it would just take over. So it made the game easier to play, it made anybody out there. With um, a short swing. A decent tennis player. Yep. Even with a long swing. I mean, it, it kind of stabilized it for you. And as long as you you swung it through the hitting zone, the racket would kind of take over and finish for you. So that was the age of wide bodies in the, uh, in the 90s. But we went from being overpowered to smelling. Skunk. <laughs> Well, I think it was a little bit also of players that used mid-size rackets, mm -hmm. you know, weren't, were younger, potentially looking to continue their mid-size um, evolution. And then the skunk was phenomenal. This was a great stick. I know we sold a lot of these, had lots of good juniors playing with them. And um, yeah, it was good. I remember the, also that purple and black 5.2 mm -hmm. was a really right. good one too as well. Um, and then over there, the great pro staff classic six <laughs> let's, one let's not jump ahead let's not jump ahead ah! <laughs> because okay, i can wait because i just like you everybody in the whole world sold a ton of these because this was a racket of that generation whether you were 12 or 18 or somebody getting into tennis like this was the racket you got. Most of the time you got the 95. Uh, there was a 110 mate. Yep. Um, I would say it was 85% 95 and 15% 110. Right. Yeah, because the, the 110 people usually were looking for something maybe a little bit stiffer, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. um, Easier to play with too. Yeah. yeah. But if you were uh, in your 30s, maybe in your early 40s, this was probably your racket. 
when you were in high school. And I'll bet you there's one of these lying around in your garage somewhere. But yeah, this defined the 2000s. And it told you even where the sweet spot was. Yeah, a little higher. Exactly. <laughs> because of what? Hammer technology. Right, you move the sweet spot further up the racket. Right, and they made it controllable. Uh -huh. Right, 6.2 versus 2.7. Right, super stiff. It brought in the control. PWS here, too. They added weight weighting here, 3 and 9 for stability. No right. stability here, just straight power. So this defined the people in the 2000s, 2000, like end of 2010, to the 2010, approximately. But... And you still got the sponge grip. I know, Don't right? Don't forget the sponge. That thing almost feels new. Yes. <laughs> That's nice. Do you remember today's sponge? Coach Rob, it's a little cold. I'm freezing, Harry. Keep moving your feet. <laughs> <laughs> and it's dark. <laughs> Ooh, I can't then, barely see. Then you better not miss, Harry, because then you're going <laughs> to get colder. Here we go. Ooh. Ooh, gosh. All right. Do you want that, pro? That will make you play in the dark, make you play in the freezing cold, not let you give up on your tennis. Well, I got my coach, Rob. You can get your coach, Rob, at Play Your Court. You can find over 27,000 players out there, coaches and playing partners, all at playyourcourt.com. All right, so going back to... Uh, Whatever this thing is. <laughs> this is the Wilson Pro Staff Classic 6.1. So I have a question about this racket that yes. have always bugged me. Okay. From the inception of this racket, okay. the first day I laid eyes on it. Right. In, I would say, the 90s. Four and five eighths grip. Yes. Now... Why did they call it good. classic? Because it was the first, it, it just came out and they were yep. already calling it classic. Well, I think they were trying to take the classic feel, oh, okay. right? So from you have pro staff, right? You have the old um, or the newer compared to the wood, you have this pro staff. Mm -hmm. So I think they were trying to create um, that feel of the classic weight and balance and um, feel of these older rackets in a little bit larger head size. Right, okay, um, I get so it. So I think that was the idea, was how to take what everybody liked in these and these mm -hmm. and give it a little bit bigger head size and maybe a little bit more, I'm uh, guessing this had a little more power than the smaller Oh yeah, one, but 95 yeah. versus 85. Um, now what did you like so much about this racket? Uh, the weight, the balance, the feel, the touch. Um, it, it, once you got it going, it took off and followed through for mm -hmm, you, and mm -hmm. it had, um, you know, a bigger sweet spot than these older ones. So if um, I may have mishit the ball, I had a little bigger sweet spot. It was a little more forgiving, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it, it was just a great racket. And, yep. and I think it was at that age I was playing a lot. I was competing. So it was at that right time where, um, you know, you have a lot of good memories with the racket. Right. So I remember these being introduced in the 90s um, and it immediately became like a top seller. Right. It has the, what's it, a uh, graphite uh, Kevlar on yep. there? Yep. It's probably made it a little bit stiffer. Yep. Totally. But literally everybody was using this racket. Everybody. Yep. Even people who really shouldn't use this racket were using this racket. Right. So it's kind of like the uh, Fed of its day <laughs> right yep probably the heaviest racket back then too if i don't if i'm not mistaken but 80 percent graphite 20 percent kevlar as it says right there so stiff but 6.1 flexible 
Right. You could take a full swing at it and mm -hmm. you had to, to generate the power. Right. Now, which pro used this? Who's, who use, who, whose name is uh, synonymous with this racket? Well, so many of them started with this mm -hmm. and then moved their way up. So was it like Edberg, Sampras? Yep. Edberg. Did Sampras ever go to that one? I don't remember. No. So he, he stayed, he stayed here. Um, um, but Edberg, Edberg was the, the face of this of racket. That one. Okay. Yeah. He, I don't think he used it, though. I don't think he used it, though. And I'm sure a lot of them just paint job it. and Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so, rackets of, a, of that generation. Uh, <laughs> now, so we went to 6.2 in the 2000s. That, that, this is probably 90s into the early 2000s. Um, starting in 2010, we had changes going on. 100 square inch rackets were coming on board and being more prevalent. Um, I wasn't sure what the why, but you went from here to 100. And the dawn of Not a new company, but a company that well, is new in the racket industry, correct. not in the string industry. Right. So we all know Babylon as making great gut, uh, VS gut to be exact. And then suddenly they started making 100 square inch rackets in pure drive form and in pure control form, which is a little smaller and more for the players. But this is the one that everybody was using and growing with, starting young with. I, I think the they were marketing to that up and coming junior and were they like giving them out at tournaments mm -hmm. or I don't remember. I was not at that level at that time. So I don't. I'm just trying to remember the stories that we heard. Right. They were building a brand. Right. So they, the first time I saw this racket was at a Cal versus Stanford match oh. at, at, at Cal of all places. And I was seeing a bunch of the guys swinging this racket around and I saw the white line here and a white line there. I'm like, what is that thing? And I, came back and I looked it up. It's a Babolat racket. And the weird thing was... Um, back then, it was hard to look up. Right. There was no <laughs> there internet. There was no phone, no internet. <laughs> right, right. I forgot how I even found yeah, out. Yeah, how you look it up? What did you use? Encyclopedia. Yeah, right. <laughs> Tennis magazine. Probably that's what we all had. Right. Tennis magazines. True. We were, every time you came, got one, you're like, all right, let's see what's out there. And True, um, true, true, true. And... Now, when, when this started coming out, people were asking for it just because they got into those tournaments, started sponsoring kids, sponsoring um, college kids, sponsoring college teams, and just kind of bringing the brand forward. Right. And then people started calling, like, where can I get a Babolat? And I was like, well, what is a Babolat racket? You know, so uh, that's how it kind of grew. Right. And then by 2010, everybody knew what this was. And it was already, you know, at the top of the sales in terms of, you know, national sales. Who do you think the first guy on tour was who we really recognized using it? So the, uh, the thing that props into my mind is Andy Roddick, me, me but that's not that's not right. Um, that's what I think of when I think of that racket. Yeah. But that's why I'm like, there probably was somebody before that who he... There was, but I forget uh, his name. I don't know who yeah. it was. Yeah, like a Gonzalez or a... Not Verdasco, but somebody like that. That was the face of it. And there was a woman, too, that I, it escapes my mind right now. That, Someone will tell us in the comments. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That let us know. I mean, I, I was reading about it, and I remember it when I needed to. But it, uh, there was somebody before Roddick. Roddick was the one that put it on the map, though. Uh, right. 
So, and then Kleisters, I remember, used a version of it too. Mm -hmm. uh, and then fast forward to today, there's no real name on it anymore though, right? It's just known as being... Um, Right, well, then, as market. it is involved, now there's a peer strike, mm -hmm. was Dominic team using that. Right. Um, but it's kind of gotten off Babylon's of, gone into the pure era with the right. and all that stuff. So Right, but it, this particular rocket right. has kind of gotten off of tour, though, like tour level, into weekend warrior status. And that's kind of, you know, why it's still so popular, because everybody's using it. Uh, for its all-around effectiveness on the court. Right. So, but that's the one that ruled, and it started with that one. Remember, the, the first one was the Rotic Plus version, half-inch longer, and then really? 11 ounces. Yeah, the one that Don't had Rotic that. signature on it. So it was half-inch longer, 11 ounces before strings. Wow, did not know that. Yep, and when Rotic came off, that racket started... And then the mm -hmm. regular version, 10.6, which is, you know, prevalent today, is the one that kind of took over in sales. I think they actually discontinued that Rotic Plus, which changed names into Tor Plus eventually. Mm -hmm. But that's now gone since Rotic is gone. Um, so unless, that, unless you're watching the tennis channel. That's, that's true. Look at some Good history. Commentator. Yeah. <laughs> now, that into the 2010s um, as we reach the 2020s we're only like three years into the 2020s maybe a little more and uh, what do you think I mean if, if Rob is pointing at something that means it's probably... flash time oh wait let, let's backtrack for one second like one sorry guys um, before this hit the heights, there was one racket that uh, that was up there, and I I don't have one though. Um, do you remember the? Do you remember Sharapova? Um, I, uh, she's hard to forget. <laughs> so yes, I do remember Maria Sharapova. She used that Prince O3 white, and that ruled and dominated for, I want to say for almost five-ish years. Uh, they that one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I they, remember the, that Prince, there was a bunch of them. There was a black and white. Mm -hmm. There was, mm -hmm. it had the um, strange string pattern. With, with the big, big holes. holes that yep. was not fun to string. Right. Um, yeah, they, they ruled for four to five years. And then uh, uh, when they switched that racket to the exoskeleton, mm -hmm. I'm not sure what happened and... The, the sales started to drop and then kind of pure drive kind of took over the the top spot. So honorable mention to uh, Prince 03 White. Okay, now we can fast forward to the 2020s. Oh, the clash, let's go. <laughs> so the racket that's really the 2020s right now is the clash. I brought in the original color and version um 98 98 oh i even brought in 98 okay yeah. and uh what was it about this racket that made it so special and and dominated so far the 2020s well i think wilson took tried to go back and just start over and try to find what feel is like everybody goes, oh i want a racket that feels good well how do you explain or how do you describe feel so I think they went back and tried to go, oh, people like the feel of these. People like the feel of this. Okay, how do I get the racket to flex and you know, also still be stable? Right. Um, and so that was sort of what they were building towards and came up with the Clash. More times it was the 100 than, than the 98 right here. But, um, you know, and then you had the the Clash Pro, which mm -hmm. is a little heavier one. Mm -hmm. um, and then... Yeah, what, I think there's what a Clash 108. 108, right, right, mm -hmm. right. and then a so, light, and, then, and, and then I think there's an ultra light too that I never, I've never sold very many of. Right, but yeah, there was a whole Clash line. Correct. Uh, for those of you who don't know what Clash is, it's extremely unique. It's got an extremely low flex 
rating. So unlike any of these rackets where it's a firmer racket, which gives you the power, the stiffness, the stability, this is different. It's soft. When you hit it, it bends and it bends a lot. But at some point, it stops, firms up, and then shoots the ball out. If you want it to be firm, you swing faster, you swing harder, the ball won't dwell on the string bed so long because of your swing. If you want it to be um, softer and you want to do a touch shot or a drop volley, then you kind of lay off of it and just feather it a little bit. It will just bend and give you a softer feel and a lot more flex. So the one complaint that I always get about this racket and people say this is I can't hit a volley with it. Yeah, we've talked about that. <laughs> I think we did a video on that. Right, right. So the way to hit a volley with a clash is the way you would hit a volley with this wooden racket. You watch the ball. Watch it. <laughs> that too. You can't just stick your racket out, expect the ball to like take off. You have to kind of complete your stroke from start to finish. Um, and so it brings us back to earlier days and fundamentals. Uh, but everybody else, I would say 80% of the people understand this racket. Like they know exactly what to do. And those of those are the people, those people who don't know, all I have to do is say, just swing. And when I say just swing, they understand that. Because when they do, they understand. Ball goes in. When you lay off of it, it takes off. <laughs> yep. And then they had even came up with some smart string. Yes. To try to, uh, Lexalon tried to put a string in there that would... Uh, like you said, match the racket. Right. Mm -hmm. So they suggested you use a smart string, which was like a copoly um, that did exactly what the racket did. Swing hard, firms up. Swing soft, softens up. Um, unfortunately, that racket is, excuse those, me, those that strings. string is no longer around. Um, I did well with it, but I guess nobody else did. Uh, but it, it matched it very well. 48 pounds. On any of the models with the smart string, one, two, five, if you don't break strings, was the way to go. But, you know, it is what it is. The racket survives and the string doesn't. Uh, but that is currently the racket of the 2020s. Coach Rob, how, how is this walk down memory lane? It was great going back to the, uh, you know, pulling out the, the Kramer again and, and seeing the 6-1 um, classic was, was great, um, as well as the Skunk. That was fun. Those were rackets that um, have been very successful. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, it's cool seeing the old T2000 again. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it can't go wrong with the Pro Staff midsize. You know, and I know it's a it's a lot of Wilson. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's a lot of Wilson, but sprinkled in with some Prince and then Babylon, still major player. So, all right, guys, seventies um, to today, the rackets that dominated the decades. Coach Rob, thank you so much sure. for the walk down memory lane. Happy to do it. All right. Guys, thank you for watching Tennis Spin, where we put our spin on your tennis.